Good afternoon. It's uh, Tuesday, May 18th, and we're very uh, excited to have Harder Seacrest and Emery joining us today with a very timely speaker series um, topic. And it's all about labor and law um, or labor and employment law. And there's so many things that are happening right now that uh, um, employers have to understand. So we're hoping we can uh, kind of drill down into that, simplify it a little bit too, perhaps, but uh, also get some questions answered. So feel free to um, just in the chat, to, uh, to me to ask questions and we'll, we'll get to that at the end. But uh, they've got quite a, a lot of information to share. And so I wanna introduce Chloe McDonald and Anna McCarthy from Harder Seacrest and Emory. And uh, ladies, whoever's gonna start, I'll change my screen to um, give you a shot there. And, and we're welcoming here some new members actually, Dan um, Hensel from Amton Auto, I see, and Rachel, good morning. And uh, Jonathan Jasinski is also here, and we've got some other people. So uh, I know Dan, just so, you know, because Dan's on the, and Rachel are on the call, uh, they own an auto mechanic um, shop, and that's my auto mechanic. Love those guys. And uh, so they may have particular uh, questions regarding, you know, um, that size business, you know, small business, and, and what, are they, what are they doing? So Anna or Chloe, take it away. Thank you so much, Kathy, and thank you for, for having us this afternoon. Um, so my name is Anna McCarthy, and as Cassie, Kathy said, I'm here with my colleague, Chloe McDonald, and we're members of Harder Sea Crest and Emory's labor and employment team. Um, and thank you so much for, to the Kenton Chamber of Commerce for having us today um, to talk about some of the recent uh, federal and state employment law developments that have implications for um, businesses in this very um, turbulent time. So before we get started, I just need to add that this presentation is intended to be for general information purposes only and should not be considered as legal advice. And I also want to note that we're, we're aiming to leave a few minutes at the end. So um, if those on the call have questions, um, we can try to address those at the end. Um, so with all that said, we're going to get started and I'm going to turn it over to Chloe to give us a quick overview of what we're going to talk about today. Hello. Um, so here is our agenda for today's presentation. And as I'm sure you can tell by all the bullets on the slide, we do have a lot to cover today. So we'll get right to it. Wage and hour stuff is going to be super quick. COVID stuff will kind of be the meat and potatoes of the presentation. And then we're going to wrap up with some discussion on marijuana legalization, everyone's fave topic. So um, we'll jump right into the wage and hour stuff. Um, into the minimum wage thresholds. So you're probably aware New York has been steadily increasing the minimum wage in kind of preset increments. They started in 2016 and we've been going since then. So here at the end of 2020, going into 2021, we reached the end of these kind of preset increments. So what's next? Uh, excluding New York City, annual increases to the rest of the state are gonna continue until the minimum wage rate reaches $15 per hour. Um, starting in 2021, the annual increases will be published by the Commissioner of Labor on or before October 1, and they're going to be based on um, a, a percent increase determined by the like budget division, and it's going to be based on some sort of like economic price index. So we'll see that coming. Just a tip to keep looking for that in October of 2021. Moving on to the uh, salary thresholds for the white collar employees, right? These have been increasing over time too. We had some new increases at the end of 2020 going into 2021. And um, these have just increased every time the minimum wage has increased. There are federal thresholds. You may hear about those or see discussion of those on the news. Those are pretty much uh, irrelevant to New York employers because the New York threshold is uh, really always greater than the federal salary threshold for those exempt employees. Um, so there's our really quick wage and hour update and I'm gonna turn it back to Anna to talk about some paid leave. Thanks, Chloe. So as, as she mentioned, um, we're gonna spend the bulk of the presentation on COVID related considerations and paid leave is definitely something that's been top of mind for many employers uh, throughout the pandemic. And even as we sort of enter this new phase of hopefully moving towards post pandemic life. Um, so what, what I'm going to discuss today 
um, includes some of the overlapping obligations that you may have as employers, including small employers. So specifically, I'll touch on COVID-19 paid sick leave, which was effective last year, so more than a year ago now. Um, the New York State paid sick leave law, which was effective in January of this year, and the New York State COVID-19 vaccine leave law, uh, which became effective in March of 2021, so just a couple of months ago. And then I'll also touch on um, some federal leave options under um, what used to be the FFCRA, so emergency paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave. There are some tax credits available for employers who voluntarily choose to provide um, leave again under what was once the FFCRA um, from last year. Um, so what we won't discuss today, and there are other, there's some other laws and obligations that, that we're not going to be talking about. Um, these laws are laws that you're likely already familiar with. They're laws that you may have already been operating under. The FMLA maybe not um, if you've got under 50 employees, um, that's protected leave but no pay uh, for 12 weeks, 12 weeks from the federal level. Um, but then you may already be familiar, I'm sure you're already familiar with New York paid family leave, which is protected leave and partial pay, usually through um, your insurance carrier. And then New York workers' compensation and disability benefits. We won't be talking about those in great detail, um, but as you are likely already familiar with, that is compensation but not protected leave aside from non-retaliation provisions um, for both work-related injuries and illnesses, so that's workers' comp, and for non-work-related injuries and illnesses, that's disability. So these, again, are all laws you've already been operating under. There are links there to guidance um, for your reference. Uh, but what we're really focusing on, again, are the basics of these um, five bullets here. So this is a bit of a cheat sheet regarding the leaves that we'll talk about. Um, the vaccine leave law, that's up to four hours of paid time to get the COVID-19 vaccine, and that's per injection. This is all New York employers, uh, both, both pu public and private actually. Um, then there's the New York COVID uh, paid sick leave law, which is up to 14 days of paid time um, for employees who are subject to an order of quarantine or isolation from a government agency. Um, again, this is all New York employers, but it is the benefit is dependent on employer size. Um, and again, you, you're likely already familiar with this law. It's been around since March of 2020, um, but we're talking about it today because it overlaps with some more recent leave obligations. Um, next, we have New York paid sick leave. This is up to 56 hours of paid time for basically any self or family related, sick or safe related reason. Um, it's all private New York employers who are subject to this law. But again, the benefit like the COVID paid sick leave law is size dependent. Um, so you don't necessarily need to give up to 56 hours depending on the size that you are. And we'll get into that a little bit um, in a little bit. Um, the uh, next law is New York paid family leave. I said we wouldn't be delving into this too much, but it does overlap a little bit with what we're talking about. So I'm mentioning it here uh, just briefly. That's uh, 12 weeks of partial paid time, normally through an insurance provider. Uh, the trigger is usually when there's a new child or a family member serious health condition or a medical deployment, um, and you're taking care of the family member and their serious, serious health condition or taking time related to a family member's um, excuse me, not medical deployment, military deployment. Um, and then finally, uh, there's not a lot of detail on this slide because there's more detail than can fit on this slide, but uh, under what was once the FFCRA, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, um, we had emergency paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave. Um, so these were, were paid sick leave uh, requirements. And now we have a voluntary tax credit program for certain employers. Um, that they can choose to participate in. So that's sort of the brief overview of what we're talking about. So I'm gonna delve a little deeper into each of those. First, again, the vaccine leave. So this law, um, it's, it was added to the labor law um, and it requires all employers to provide employees with a sufficient period of time, up to four hours of paid leave to receive the vaccine. And again, that's per injection. So if we're thinking now about what the vaccine landscape looks like, that would be up to eight hours, up to four per injection uh, for the two shots if you're getting Pfizer or Moderna, for example, or up to four hours if you're getting the one Johnson & Johnson. Um, now, uh, the leave cannot be charged against any other leave that the employee is already entitled to, including New York State paid sick leave. So this is a separate entitlement, separate bucket of time. Um, and the entire period of leave has to be provided at an employee's regular rate of pay. Um, 
Now, uh, an employee who requests or uses leave uh, can't be retaliated against. That's pretty standard when you're talking about these paid leave laws. There's usually a non-retaliation uh, provision in that law. Um, it was effective immediately, so effective in March when it was signed, um, and it applies now. And uh, you may, you very likely have already run into this, um, where someone needs to take time away from work to get um, the COVID-19 um, vaccine. So uh, what the law does not discuss um, are two important things. One is documentation and one is notice. Um, so for example, can employers ask for proof of vaccination and what proof would that be? Um, so in terms of that, um, an employer can um, most likely, and, and I, we've been you know, advising uh, clients most recently that they can most likely ask for proof um, of the fact that maybe they have an appointment, um, where that appointment is. And that's actually a, an important part of the discussion because you need to know how much time to give the employee. So for example, um, is the appointment an hour away? So they need a little bit of extra time to get there. That will be part of that sufficient period of time that they need to get that vaccine. Is the appointment only 15 minutes away? So they don't need as much time um, to, to take the or to, to get the injection. Um, so these are all considerations that you might go through when you have an employee who requests the leave. In terms of policy uh, requirements, New York State does technically require you to have written policies on leave. Um, so you could choose to address this in writing in a policy or at least some kind of written announcement. At the very least though, of course, if someone asks to take this leave, you do need to give them the leave if they, if they qualify. Um, just another note that this law will be repealed in December of 2022. So that's kind of interesting because um, right now there's a big push to get everyone vaccinated, but it may be that as we get on into 2021 and then into 2022, there could be booster shots. Um, you know, additional guidance about getting the vaccine yearly. And this could theoretically then apply to serve as more leave time for someone who needs to get a booster shot um, or another shot next year. So we'll see if the state decides to extend it further, but right now it'll be repealed at the end of 2022. Um, so it'll be, it will remain um, in effect until then. Uh, the next law is New York State paid sick leave. So again, you're probably already all familiar with this law. Um, and maybe even heard Chloe and myself talk about it last year when we spoke to the chamber. Um, so again, I'll run through the section fairly quickly. Um, this was uh, added during last year's budget process. And um, we are now, New York State is one of a handful of states with a paid sick leave law. So now every private employer has to provide um, sick leave under this law to their employees, um, but it is uh, dependent on the size of the employer. So generally speaking, if you have under five employees, um, whether or not uh, you need to provide 40 hours, or rather if you have under 100 employees, you need to provide 40 hours of sick leave. Whether or not that 40 hours is paid if you have under 100 employees depends on your size and how much money you make. But for most employers between five and 99 employees, with five, between five and 99 employees, it's paid 40 hours of sick, sick leave. Um, if you have 100 or more employees, it's paid 56 hours of sick, sick leave. Um, so again, benefit uh, is dependent on size. The accrual rate is one hour of sick leave for every 30 hours worked and that the accrual would have started last year in September of 2020. Alternatively, some employers have chosen to front load the time. So you can front load the 40 hours or the 56 hours on January 1 of each year, for example. And that sort of takes care of you for the rest of the year. You've already given the, the maximum entitlement. You don't need to give any more. Um, once you're out of sick leave, there's, there's nothing. And if nothing else applies, the leave's not protected anymore and an employer's regular attendance policy can kick in. Um, what can you use the leave for? Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, it's basically any typical sick or safe leave reason. So an annual physical, um, I'm out sick, my kid's out sick and I have to take them to the doctors, my mom needs a ride to her doctor's appointment. All of those reasons would be covered. Um, in addition to safe leave reasons related to instances of domestic violence, family offenses, sexual offenses. Um, there's no actual requirement for treatment or diagnosis. It could just be a, a doctor's appointment. Um, one really important point on the slide is carryover. The law requires that carryover of leave is unlimited. So every year your employee is entitled to carry over what, what leave they have not used. So if you front load or if they accrue up to 40 hours, 
and they never use any of the 40 hours under the law, they're required, you are required to allow them to carry over that unused 40 hours into the next year. Um, now, that ends up with the weird result of allowing employees to potentially accrue vast banks of unused sick time with the, um, you know, with, sorry, with vast uh, banks of, um, excuse me, vast amounts of time in their sick leave bank. Um, and that's kind of an odd result because um, employers were concerned. Does that mean that an employee can just use all of this time? Um, you know, we're potentially out of luck. And that, that's not the case. Um, employees can uh, carry over unlimited amounts year over year. Um, and in fact, they need to under the law, but an employer can limit the amount of time that an employee both accrues and uses during the year. So you can limit accrual to the maximum allotment of 40 or 56. You can also limit, limit usage in a year to 40 or 56. So that allows um, an employer to um, cut down on the amount of leave that they could potentially uh, need to give or need to allow their employee to use each year. Um, now, again, this is old news. I'm bringing it up because some things have come up over the last year since it's been um, implemented, uh, namely a reminder that employees must be permitted to request time either orally or in writing, and there's no specific amount of advance notice required. Um, so that's important. Um, employers also can't require the disclosure of confidential information. So you can't ask about what the diagnosis is, for example, if it's if the employee is taking um, sick leave or details of an incident of domestic violence if the employee is taking safe leave. Um, employers also should have a written policy and it should be clear regarding accrual, regarding usage, and also particularly regarding payout upon termination. That's really important. You wanna make sure that if you do not allow payout upon termination, that that is clear in your policy. Um, and then finally, employers can use an existing PTO policy, for example, personal time policy, as long as it meets the minimum requirements of the law. Um, so that was a really fast overview. I didn't wanna to spend too much time on that because we've got a few other types of leave to go through um, before I turn it back to Chloe. So uh, the next uh, type of leave is COVID paid sick leave. And generally um, this, was, this law again was passed last year. And generally, this applies to um, an employee who is subject, again, to a government mandatory or precautionary order uh, to quarantine when that employee is unable to work or telework. Um, this can't be set off by any other New York paid benefit, and it's structured by employer size. So the structure is on this slide. I won't go into, it, into, into this in enormous detail, but suffice to say the benefit is a maximum of 14 days of paid sick leave if you're a larger employer or a minimum of none, but eligibility for disability and paid family leave benefits. Um, so there's a range of no time up to 14 days of time. Um, now, what's interesting about this is that the state has um, allowed paid, or excuse me, paid family leave and disability to stack. Um, and that's different from normal. So normally um, they would not stack, but now um, employees who are not entitled to any particular days under this law, but who are entitled to apply for disability or paid family leave, if they're subject to an order of quarantine, um, they can apply for both disability benefits and paid family leave benefits. And you'll notice the disability benefit is actually at quite an elevated um, rate, which is much higher than the typical rate that's in the hundreds um, for a disability um, payment from, a, from an insurance carrier. So this is significant because it means that an employee can apply for disability and paid family leave if they're out sick um, because of a, an order of quarantine um, or isolation from, from a government agency. Again, you're probably familiar with this. It may have already come up for you um, several times over the last year. Um, now, there are exceptions um, for this paid time off. So this is probably less relevant now because travel restrictions have really been lifted at this point. But if an employee voluntarily travels and that travel subjects them to an order, this leave would not apply. It also doesn't apply to asymptomatic employees able to work from home. So if someone's subject to an order, but they're still able to work from home, they don't have symptoms, they would not be entitled to this pay. Um, it also importantly, is offset by overlapping federal benefits. So the federal benefit, if any, would kick in first. So for example, if you're voluntary, voluntarily participating in um, the 
federal leave uh, that we'll talk about in a little bit, that this COVID-19 paid sick leave under New York law would kick in only after the federal benefit is gone. Um, so it acts as a supplement beyond any federal benefits, not in addition to. Um, just another note about COVID paid sick leave, there was some guidance that was issued in January from the Department of Health, um, or rather the Department of Labor in conjunction with the Department of Health. The short version uh, of this guidance is that if an employee is subject to an initial period of quarantine, they get paid under regular New York COVID paid sick leave. Either uh, they apply for paid family leave or they apply for disability or both, or they get up to 14 days of paid leave depending on the employer size. Um, so they get paid for that initial period. Then if they test positive, uh, this guidance says that's automatically, that automatically means the employee is subject to another order of quarantine and potentially a third. So those two and two, uh, second and third times are a trigger for potentially an additional period of paid leave. What the guidance didn't cover is whether an employer is obligated to actually pay out of pocket for those additional periods of leave. Um, so what the practical guidance uh, has been um, that there's little harm in having an employee apply for paid family leave and disability if they're subject to two and three orders um, of, of quarantine. Um, so again, the, the guidance was not incredibly clear, um, but there's not harm. I, we don't think that there's harm. And anecdotally, we've heard that these claims have gone through. So if an employee is subject to a second or third order of quarantine, we've heard that if they've applied for paid family leave and disability, um, that that claim has gone through and they've received pay from the state. So finally, last type of leave. This is the Old Families First Coronavirus Act from 2020. So this was effective, and it actually says April 2nd. Um, it should say April 1. Originally, we were all thinking it was April 2nd, but it was uh, effective April 1 through the end of 2020, last year. Um, and this was mandatory paid leave and extended family and medical leave for all employers with fewer than 500 employees. And you would get a tax credit for offering that leave. So that was mandatory. Um, now in December of 2020, this was voluntary, voluntarily, excuse me, voluntary participation was extended. So you had to, man, you, you were required to participate and give this leave through the end of 2020. Then starting in January through March, you could voluntarily participate if you were under 500 employees um, in continuing to provide this leave to your employees and you could get a tax credit for it. So you could work with your accountant, submit the proper paperwork, get a tax credit for it. Um, so that was sort of the old uh, FFCRA. Um, so again, part of the old FFCRA was the fact that you got two weeks of emergency paid sick leave for any of these six reasons that are on here. So um, generally speaking, it's if you're subject to an order of quarantine, you've been advised to self-quarantine, you're experiencing, experiencing symptoms of COVID, you're taking care of a child whose school has closed, um, you're taking care of someone who's subject to an order of quarantine. So these were all reasons you could take leave under the FFCRA and specifically the emergency paid sick leave. So this was up to 80 hours of emergency paid sick leave. In addition to that, there was expanded family medical leave specifically for an employee who needed to take care of um, a child whose place of care or school was closed. Um, and that was up to um, 12 weeks uh, of leave, but 10 that were paid. Um, and the pay was different. Uh, you may recall that emergency paid sick leave was paid at a rate of up to $511 per day for the first three reasons that were on the previous slide, um, or at a lower rate uh, for the uh, reasons four, five, and six. So taking care of someone who is sick or taking care of a child. Um, so again, this was all part of the old FFCRA, but it still applies if you voluntarily participate to extend this leave to your employees. And that comes in here because as of April 1, so as of just last month, employers could voluntarily participate to still continue to give these types of leave to their employees. So still continue, continue to give up to 80 hours um, of emergency paid sick leave and still continue to give um, employees the opportunity to take expanded family medical leave to take care of a child uh, whose school or place of uh, care was closed. Um, what the American Rescue Plan Act also did was add ex additional reasons um, to take emergency paid sick leave and expanded family and medical leave. So now you could take it if you are exposed to COVID or you require a test, 
if you're obtaining the vaccine, um, or if you're recovering from an adverse reaction to the vaccine. So now there are these additional reasons. Um, importantly, emergency paid sick leave reset on April 1. So if you're going to voluntarily participate in giving this to your employees, the emergency paid sick leave benefit resets on April 1 and employees get up to 80 hours through September, which is when this benefit ends or when the ability to get a tax credit ends. Um, so the bottom line is if you were previously subject to the FFCRA, you have under 500 employees, you had to provide this leave last year. This year, you can voluntarily continue to give that leave and get a tax credit for it, but you don't have to. So you do not have to, you know, if you decide you don't want to do this, forget all this information, you don't need to give it, um, but it's an option. There are some things that were not clear under the American Rescue Plan Act, and we're still hoping to see some guidance from the Department of Labor, Department of Labor or the Internal Revenue Service um, on a few open issues, namely, um, it's a little unclear how and when leaves run concurrently. Um, so for example, New York state leaves that we've been talking about with the federal leave, whether or not an employer can choose to only give a portion of emergency paid sick leave or a portion of expanded family and medical leave and end the program early. Um, so that's a little unclear. And again, the documentation um, needed to apply for the, the payroll tax credit, that's also been unclear, but we would suggest you work with your accountant if you're going to voluntarily give these leaves to your employees. Um, now, the IRS did issue a fact sheet towards the end of April. It didn't provide a ton of guidance, but it did reiterate that this is something that employers can voluntarily participate in if they would like to. So just to sort of wrap up the leave section um, before we move on, uh, just a few additional pointers. Um, so the, the FFCRA tax credits, if you decide to voluntarily participate in giving your employees either emergency paid sick leave or expanded family and medical leave or both, those can run concurrent um, with New York State COVID uh, sick leave. That's the quarantine order sick leave. And they may run concurrently with New York State vaccine leave. So you'll recall vaccine leave is used for employees um, who are getting the vaccine per injection. Um, and one of the new reasons to use the FFCRE leave is for getting a, a vaccine, getting the COVID vaccine. So given the fact that both of those leaves cover the same reason, it's looking like those can run concurrently. However, the FFCRE tax credits cannot run concurrently with New York State paid sick leave. That's a, a totally separate bucket of time that employers are, employees are entitled to. Um, the New York State paid sick leaves that we talked about COVID sick leave, vaccine leave, and paid sick leave, those cannot run concurrently with each other. They're separate buckets of time. Unpaid FMLA can probably run concurrently with almost anything. It's unpaid uh, protected leave. And finally, um, employers can't force paid family leave to run concurrently with any other paid time off. It can be an option. Um, so an employer employee may take paid family leave, um, for example, to bond with a, a child. Um, you can't force an employee to supplement that uh, the benefit that they're getting with, for example, um, personal time, but you can offer that as a choice. So those are just a few additional pointers. I have some scenarios on this slide. I'll just run through one because I wanna make sure we get to other portions of the presentation. Um, so I'm gonna pick um, uh, the second one. So uh, Julia discloses COVID-19 symptoms. She stays out of work. Two days later, she tests positive and she's ordered to quarantine. Um, so the, a, the initial period when she discloses she has symptoms and she stays out of work, she's, there's no order. She's not, we don't know that she's subject to an order. She hasn't told us that. So that's just New York State paid sick leave. She's out sick, that's it. Um, when she tests positive though, then um, she'll likely receive an order, an order of quarantine. And that's when New York State COVID paid sick leave kicks in. Um, and if the order is retroactive back to the first date that she was out, for example, we might think about crediting the paid sick leave that she had to take in the first instance, uh, the New York State paid sick leave. Um, and at the same time, FSCRA tax credits might also uh, apply here. So um, if you choose to, to participate in the tax credit program, um, the FFCRA leave could um, also serve to provide leave to this employee because she's out sick uh, with COVID symptoms and then she's out sick um, under an order. Um, but don't forget, you can't run this concurrently with paid sick leave. Um, so it's either New York State paid sick leave or it's that you give FSCRA and you take the tax credit. 
Um, now, if she's working from home um, and she doesn't have symptoms, there's no time off. Um, so don't forget that if an employee is able to telework or work and they have no symptoms, that uh, the, the paid leaves don't kick in. And then finally, if she tests negative, but she stays out uh, because she's still sick, again, that just reverts back to New York State paid sick leave. She's just out sick. There's no order. Uh, there's no positive test. It's just straight paid sick leave time. Um, so that's just one of the scenarios. I hope that was helpful in, in sort of thinking about how some of these leaves interact. It's a lot, but if you have questions, go back to those cheats, cheat sheets that sort of give you the overview of what all the leaves are. And that should hopefully be um, somewhat helpful. So related to all this COVID stuff, um, Chloe's gonna talk a little bit about workplace safety. Right, uh, so we're gonna talk about the uh, HERO Act, the New York Health and Essential Rights Act. Um, and that was signed into law by Governor Cuomo just very recently on May 5th. I don't know if we can go to the, maybe the next slide. Uh, <laughs> this is one of the joys of doing Zoom presentations. <laughs> like, this is how things work. Uh, so very recent, signed on May 5th. Now, when Governor Cuomo signed this, right, even though he was signing it into law, he signed it with an announcement that, okay, well, I'm signing this, but I fully expect and anticipate that there will be chapter amendments that are going to change parts of the bill that I just signed. So uh, we can start to analyze the HERO Act, we can start to understand its implications, but just know that there are amendments, they're, pat they're um, pending in both the Assembly and the House uh, right now. So we'll talk a little bit about what those amendments might cover and then what the law uh, covers right now. Now the HERO Act is intended to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and other airborne diseases in the workplace. So although this act was developed in response to COVID and all the things that employers had to do uh, to respond to the pandemic, it is not COVID-19 specific. So this will continue uh, once uh, all of this uh, COVID-19 stuff is resolved. And although the act has really good intentions, it does have some serious compliance challenges for employers, a lot of things that employers need to think about so that they can comply with the HERO Act. And if we boil this act down to its simplest form, there's essentially three things we need to worry about. The first is the safety plan. Employers need to create safety plans and that's any employer. There doesn't, there's no you know, number requirement there. Second, employers with at least 10 employees need to allow for safety committees and there's requirements as to how those committees need to be made up and what those committees can do. And then the third thing we want to think about are the non-retaliation components of the HERO Act, uh, which protect employees from retaliation um, for you know, taking action under the HERO Act. And then also the possibility of private causes of action, which you know may increase litigation um, and we'll talk about that in more detail on a later slide. So first thing we'll talk about is the plan and private employers need to adopt air, airborne infectious disease exposure prevention plans. That is a mouthful, but that's what they need to adopt for their workplaces. And it sounds intimidating, right? It's like, oh my gosh, another plan. We've done so many plans this past year <laughs> in a couple months. Um, and how are employers supposed to know what the heck these plans need to include? Well, never fear because the HERO Act does task the Commissioner of Labor in conjunction with the Department of Health to create model standards for employers to follow. And these standards are going to be industry specific. And we kind of know how this is gonna play out because we had some industry specific standards for COVID, right? So there's gonna be guidance for different industries and probably some general catch-all category as well. Um, so we'll see those. And employers can just meet their plan requirements by adopting the DOL's minimum standards. Employers can create their own as long as they are you know, meeting those minimum standards. There's always the option to go above and beyond, uh, but you know, at least we're gonna have these model standards for employers to um, adopt, uh, which should make the process a little bit easier. Now, there is a very long list of things in the HERO Act that these plans must go over, but it's gonna look familiar, right? It's gonna cover PPE, it's gonna cover social distancing, face coverings, uh, cleaning and disinfecting, ventilation, uh, quarantine and isolation protocols. So the model standard should cover all of those things, explain what the minimum standards are for each of those categories that's listed, but it, I mean, it's gonna be stuff that we're all familiar with because of what happened over the past year and a couple months. 
So you're probably wondering, well, when do I as an employer need to have this in place? When do I as an employee get to see this plan my employer is putting together? As currently drafted, this requirement would go into place June 4th. I'm like, well, that is just right around the corner. Um, I better get right to work. Now, these chapter amendments that are out there, they're pending, they would change this timing requirement to require employers to adopt plans within 30 days of when the Department of Labor releases their minimum standards. And I think this makes a lot of sense, right? How are we gonna know what to put in these plans or what the minimum standards are if the DOL has not published them yet? So I'm hopeful that that will be part of the chapter amendments that you know will eventually, presumably, pass related to the HERO Act. All right, moving on to the safety plan requirement. This is going to apply to employers with 10 or more employees. And, and these employers must permit the creation of joint labor and management workplace safety committees. And if these committees are formed, right, the requirement is that you have to permit the creation of, it's not that you have to have them, but if you know employees in the workplace want a committee, you have to let them uh, create one. If formed, the committee has to meet certain requirements as to its composition. So there have to be employer and employee designees on the committee, right? The committee can't just be all employer designees, right? That wouldn't be meeting everyone's needs. And it needs to be co-chaired by an employer designee, an employee designee. And then two thirds of the members of the committee have to be rank and file employees, not supervisors or managers. The committee uh, will have multiple functions that it can do, right? It can raise health and safety concerns, report violations of that plan we just talked about on the previous slide, uh, reviewing policies, uh, if there's gonna be an on-site inspection by a governmental agency um, dealing with some health and safety standards, right? Maybe a, a committee member could uh, participate in that visit. And, and then quarterly meetings, which uh, need to be conducted during work hours. Part of these chapter amendments uh, um, deals with some of these uh, requirements. I remember reading about the quarterly meetings that they would limit them to like two hours, right? So you, you wouldn't have this endless amount of time that the safety committee could be meeting during the workday. Uh, and when does this go into effect? Well, we've got some good lead time on this part of the law, uh, which would not take effect until November 1st, 2021. So we've got like five, six months before we're gonna be looking at that in more detail. Okay. Moving to the non-retaliation stuff. Uh, uh, in addition to these new requirements for employers, the law also contains protections for employees. Uh, employers cannot retaliate against employees who exercise their rights under the HERO Act, uh, um, right? If they report violations of the employer's plans or the minimum standards, or they report that their employer hasn't adopted a plan, or you can't retaliate against an employee uh, for doing that. You can't retaliate against an employee for participating in committee activity, right? If, if they're going to make a complaint because they're on the committee and they're reporting something or they want to um, host a meeting or part of the committee uh, requirements can be allowing a committee member to go to training that's relevant to safety plans, right? The employer couldn't retaliate against an employee for those types of actions either. Um, if an employer fails to adopt the plan that is required, um, or if an employer adopts a plan but then doesn't follow it, they also may be subject to civil monetary penalties. So there is you know, some teeth to this law. The law also provides an option for employees to bring a private cause of action against an employer who is not following the standards, not following their plan, and the employer's actions are creating a substantial probability that death or serious physical harm could result. Now this private litigation um, option is probably gonna sound pretty concerning to employers. And it is something that is subject to chapter amendments. There was a lot of concern from the business uh, and in the business perspective on this part of the law in particular. So some changes that are floating around in the chapter amendments would make employees go through some extra hoops to be able to bring a private cause of action, such as requiring that they give notice to the employer, right, 30 days notice to kind of fix the violation or fix the issue before the employee can run to court and bring a claim. Um, again, these are in the chapter amendments. They're not finalized. They're not passed yet. So this is a little bit of a hypothetical, but um, I am hopeful that the chapter amendments will be finalized and passed soon. And we did post a blog, uh, HSC posted a blog on the HERO Act, and I bet we will post one when those chapter amendments pass. So um, keep looking out for that as well. All right, I'm gonna 
pass it back over to Anna. Thanks, Chloe. So related to uh, COVID um, considerations in the workplace are vaccinations um, and sort of related to safety uh, standards that Chloe was just talking about is whether or not you can require employees to get vaccinated. That's been on the minds of a lot of employers recently. Um, so the short answer, and I emphasize that this is the short answer with a lot of caveats, is yes, you can require employees to get vaccinated. Um, so the real question, though, is, is should you? Um, and most employers are leaning towards encouraging vaccination, but not requiring it. And the key is that you need to make an informed decision. Um, so the response is definitely industry specific. Um, it might depend on exposure, exposure risks, for example, within a specific workplace. So for example, hospitals, doctor's offices, nursing homes, that's a higher risk for exposure and a, a vulnerable population. Um, and hospitals already require um, their employees to get uh, certain vaccines like the flu shot. So they may consider this approach, but other industries don't see as great a risk of, of exposure based on how employees work with each other. So it's certainly a consideration and whether or not, uh, certainly should factor into your decision about whether or not you wanna require employees to get the vaccine. Um, another thing to consider is how, how you act now um, may set a precedent for boosters or annual vaccines. So that's definitely something to keep in mind um, if those end up uh, being necessary in the future. So the EEOC did issue guidance in December. They didn't expressly state that employers are permitted to require vaccines, but the way that they phrased their guidance, um, a fair reading of their guidance would indicate that employers can require as long as religious and medical accommodations are considered. So vaccines from the guidance, we know that vaccines are not considered medical inquiries or examinations under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, so employer inquiries about vaccination status are not considered to be about an employee's health status. So that was useful guidance to come out of that because that re relates directly to asking for proof. So you may not require a vaccine, you may just encourage vaccination, but you may, um, may also be thinking about proof. Um, I will say that if you're just encouraging uh, the vaccination, you may want to avoid questions about why an employee doesn't get the vaccine. Um, because first of all, if you're not requiring it, there's really no need to ask why they don't want to get it um, if you're just encouraging it. And second, it also opens up a whole host of other considerations and protections under the law, which are on the next slide and I'll talk about in just a second. Um, but if you do require the vaccine, you will want to keep track of who's been vaccinated. Um, and the EEOC has said that you can request proof of vaccination. That is okay to do. Um, but questions about why, again, an, an individual is not vaccinated can be tricky um, because questions uh, saying, you know, as a follow-up, if someone says, no, I'm not vaccinated, um, if you say why, they may just say, well, I haven't gotten an appointment yet. But they may also say, well, I've got this disability and my doctor has indicated that um, you know, maybe I shouldn't get the vaccine because of this disability or this genetic condition that I have. Um, so you start to elicit information that you don't necessarily want to have about an employee's disability status, about their genetic information, their family history. Um, so the bottom line is to uh, tread carefully if you are requiring proof and to be very careful or avoid altogether follow-up questions. And also remind employees not to give you other medical documentation. If you're asking for proof of vaccination, the vaccine card is fine, but you don't want any additional medical information. Um, you don't need it. Uh, it it's just the, the vaccine card. Um, so I mentioned that there are other laws implicated in vaccine inquiries, and uh, I have a few up here. So first is the Americans with Disabilities Act that governs disability and medical inquiries. We also have GINA that prohibits employers from inquiring about genetic and medical information because that can reveal genetic history of an employee. Um, so like a predisposition to uh, heart disease, for example. Um, and then we have Title VII, that's for employees who request a religious accommodation, and then the human rights law that also protects uh, against discrimination. So these are all laws that are implicated particularly if you're asking follow-up questions about why someone hasn't gotten the vaccine, um, or if you're requiring the vaccine, these laws are implicated if an employee objects um, and why they're objecting. So 
the bottom line here is that employers have an obligation to accommodate employees if they have a medical or religious objection, um, unless it poses an undue hardship. That's a really broad blanket statement. There are some nuances to this, and you're probably already familiar with it if you're accustomed to accommodating someone with a disability, for example, in the workplace. Um, so you need to go through the same process to see if there is an accommodation that would work for this employee who decides they don't wanna get vaccine, uh, vaccinated or they're refusing to get vaccinated. So something like an alternate work schedule, uh, maybe putting them in an area where they're not around as many people, having them wear additional uh, protective equipment. These are all potential accommodations that you might consider if someone objects. Um, now, as part of the accommodations analysis, um, an employer can also consider whether providing an accommodation to an employee who refuses would be an undue hardship. And there are different levels of um, the burden that an employer has to prove that there's an undue hardship. But generally speaking, you have to show a cost or a burden to the employer, to you as the employer and your business, um, including an expense or business interruption. Um, again, I'm really glossing over the nuances here, but the, the bottom line is that it, it's complicated. And that if an employee uh, refuses, um, you can't just terminate um, or discipline right away. You have to think about why and, and inquire why they're objecting. And again, I, I said to be careful about follow-up inquiries. So um, if you're if you're just encouraging and not requiring, I would I would caution away from those follow-up inquiries um, if, if you're not requiring the vaccine. Just a few other things to go over uh, before I hand it back to Chloe. Um, if you are considering um, having a mandatory vaccination policy, um, policy being the key word, uh, you should put it in writing. It should be a written policy. It should explain the company's position, the procedure for obtaining the vaccine, um, exemptions, the process for documenting um, an employee's objection and accommodations process. Um, there are a lot of things that should go into a written policy to make it clear what you require when you require it. So is there a deadline by which an employee has to get a vaccine? Those things should all be part of um, the written policy. And then what are the consequences? If you're really requiring a vaccine, what are the consequences going to be? And be prepared to follow through on those consequences um, and to be consistent with employees. Um, a couple other issues on here. One is that OSHA has issued related guidance. Um, and specifically, they've said that generally speaking, you can't treat vaccinated and unvaccinated employees differently. Now, that was based on the CDC guidance pre their mask announcement that you no longer have to wear masks as often um, as if you're vaccinated. So maybe OSHA will be issuing some updated guidance. We're just not sure yet. Um, the other complicating factor from OSHA is that in late April, they said if you're, that you're, if you're going to require employees to get vaccinated, and an employee then has an adverse reaction to a vaccine, that's actually considered a recordable injury um, under OSHA. So that's another complicating factor. If someone has an adverse reaction to a required vaccine, that's a recordable injury um, under OSHA, OSHA procedures. And that um, a recordable injury generally is one that's work-related, um, a new case, and one that results in some uh, one of a number of factors, including days away from work, or medical treatment beyond just um, basic first aid. So definitely something to keep in mind. Um, it's a tricky situation. There are no clear answers. I'd suggest speaking to um, an attorney if you are considering this, um, because there, there should be some thought put into a policy if you do consider um, mandating vaccines. And I'm gonna pass it on to Chloe. I know we're short on time, but she has some really important things to say about uh, the legalization of marijuana in New York State. All right, let's talk about marijuana um, to wrap the presentation up. And I think it'll be fairly fast. So on March 31st, uh, Governor Cuomo signed the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act uh, into law. And in the title of the slide, I am spelling it marijuana with a J. Technically, it is spelled with an H. Put that in there, people would think I made a typo. So we're just going to continue to spell it with a J because that's definitely the more common uh, spelling. So what did this law do? It legalized adult recreational use of marijuana. And when we say adults, we're talking about individuals 21 and up. So it's more akin to alcohol versus tobacco with the, the 21 and up uh, age requirement. Adults can lawfully possess, use, and transfer, uh, transfer cannabis, uh, um, so gifting essentially up to three ounces 
just regular cannabis and 24 grams of concentrated cannabis if you want to get into the nitty gritty. Now, based on what we've heard from the powers that be, it's going to take New York State months, possibly years to get retail sales up and running. Um, some have predicted we won't see any retail sales until 2022. Um, and we do eventually expect to see more regulations on retail sales and licensing and all that jazz. Um, so again, uh, HSC post blogs on those if that is something you're interested. Um, and even though the state did build in lots of time for itself, uh, as far as preparing for retail sales, it did not give employers the same courtesy and the employment law impact of the MRTA took effect immediately. So thanks a lot, New York. Now, before we dive into these employment law changes and the amendment to the labor law, that's really kind of the most important thing for this marijuana stuff, I just wanna quickly discuss expungement and background checks, and I'm gonna do super high level. In addition to legalizing marijuana, uh, the MRTA also included provisions to automatically vacate, dismiss, and expunge past marijuana convictions if the conviction, like the underlying conduct from the conviction, would no longer be illegal under the amended law. So since law allows possession up to three ounces, if you were previously convicted of possessing two ounces, the conviction would be eligible for automatic expungement. Uh, now the court does have a year to identify qualifying convictions. And so this drawn out expungement process, right? Things could be eligible for expungement, but the court's still looking at all the convictions, figuring out which ones need to be expunged, which ones don't. Um, it's just something that could create some background check concerns and something employers who conduct background checks should be aware of. If you're doing background check and over the next year or two, you see something that appears to be a really low level marijuana conviction, proceed cautiously before taking an adverse decision based on it. Um, don't consider expunged convictions. They shouldn't even be showing up in a background check, so that shouldn't be a, a big problem. Um, if you can tell just by looking at the conviction that it is one that should be eligible for expungement, I would probably stay away from taking any sort of adverse action or considering it all. Now, when you're considering criminal convictions, employers should be following the eight-factor analysis that is laid out in Article 23 of the New York Corrections Law. That's not new. That's super old news. So if you're not already doing that, um, make sure you look at Article 23A. And part of that Article 23 analysis is looking at the seriousness of offense. And based on legalization, it's going to be more difficult, we think, for employers to argue that a marijuana possession conviction, right, something low level, is going to be serious enough to disqualify someone from employment. Um, of course, this isn't the case for all marijuana convictions, right? If it's a really serious conviction, um, you know, uh, distribution, something like that, right? It's not going to be expunged. You can still consider it, uh, take uh, adverse action because of it. But if you're unsure, um, check with counsel. So. Let's jump into these amendments to the labor law. Uh, the MRTA immediately amended New York Labor Law Section 201D, which generally prohibits discrimination against employees for lawful off-duty conduct. So this lawful off-duty conduct section is not new. This hasn't changed, but the, the change is amending it to explicitly include cannabis use, lawful cannabis use in this law. So under the amended law, it is unlawful for an employer to refuse to hire, employ, license, um, to discharge from employment, or otherwise discriminate an individual in terms of compensation, promotion, conditions, or privileges of employment because of an individual's legal use of cannabis in accordance with state law. Um, as long as that use is prior to the beginning of work hours or after the conclusion of an employee's work hours, um, off the employer's premises and without use of the employer's equipment or other property. In essence, this means that employers are prohibited from considering an applicant or employee's legal, lawful, off, lethal, oh my goodness, legal off-duty marijuana use and employment decisions. So what are the limits on employee protection? Uh, employers still retain the ability to enact and enforce policies that pertain to cannabis in the workplace. Uh, uh, so this doesn't mean that you have to allow employees to, you know, smoke marijuana at their desk. You can still legally maintain policies that prohibit drug use at work, um, on the premises, and while using employer equipment or other property. I keep trying to envision a situation where somebody's using employer equipment to smoke marijuana, and I just can't think of one, but <laughs> maybe that, apparently that should exist under this law. Um, so there are uh, some notable exceptions to the non-discrimination provision that I was uh, just discussing. And I think those bear mentioning. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, 
And so this is an exception. These are exceptions that would allow an employer to take an adverse employment action against an employee who is lawfully using cannabis, um, but falls into one of these exceptions. Uh, so the first exception is in compliance with state or federal law. If you think this exception might apply to you, maybe there's a regulation, a local law that you think requires a discipline or drug testing or something along those lines, review it closely to make sure the action is in fact required and not merely permissible because I think that would impact the analysis. The second exception is I think the one that most employers are gonna to turn to and that um, is the ability to take an adverse action if the employee is impaired by cannabis meaning that they are manifesting specific articulable symptoms while working that decrease or lessen the employee's performance of their job duties or their job task, or the specific articulable symptoms interfere with the employer's obligation to provide a safe and healthy workplace free from hazards as required by state or federal um, OSHA type laws. So there are multiple requirements within this exception. First, we need the employee to have specific symptoms. Um, and we don't really have guidance on what those symptoms are yet. Um, maybe we will get some in the future, but I think we all kind of generally know symptoms of marijuana use, whether that's delayed reaction time, slurred speech, something along those lines. But more than just symptoms, the symptoms either have to be negatively affecting the employee's performance or um, interfering with the employer's responsibility to maintain a safe workplace. So lots of boxes we need to check here. And then the third exception um, is if uh, you know not taking this adverse action would require the employer to lose um, a federal contract or federal funding or violate federal law. So just a little bit more on these exceptions. Um, federal contractors, I think, tend to automatically say, well, I'm a federal contractor. Marijuana is still illegal under federal law, so I don't have to worry about this you know, New York legalization. I'm gonna keep testing and taking adverse action based on marijuana use. And I don't think that's a safe assumption to make. Make sure you really closely look at your contract if you have one. Uh, they'll also think about, oh, well, the Drug-Free Work Workplace Act, you know, that's gonna allow me to do things because of marijuana use. And again, that law does not mandate testing. Um, and the focus of that law is on maintaining a drug-free workplace. And we know under the amendments to the labor law that employers are still allowed to maintain those drug-free workplace policies, this has to do with lawful off-duty use. If you have transportation employees, um, I would recommend taking a look at this Omnibus Transportation Employee Testing Act. If there are CDL drivers, um, something along those lines. If it applies, then you, you may have some testing requirements under that. So what are our key takeaways? For most employers, you just need to accept that employees will and probably already are using marijuana outside of work. Um, if an employee is impaired, uh, you're gonna need to really document those symptoms. Uh, the focus should be on the underlying performance issues or safety issues rather than marijuana use. And, and if you're a federal contact, contractor, closely read that. Some thoughts on drug testing. Um, drug testing is one of the biggest questions we've seen bubble up uh, in response to this law. And surprising as it might be, the law actually does not address drug testing for employers really in any way, shape or form. So since we don't have any instruction, we're left to connect the dots ourselves. And we need to start by thinking practically. As far as pre-employment testing, well, if the labor law uh, prohibits uh, adverse action based on lawful off-duty conduct, what is pre-employment testing going to show you that's gonna be usable, right? If it's an applicant, they're not your employee yet. So any positive test result is just gonna indicate off-duty use, right? They're not your employee yet. So they couldn't possibly be using on duty. Um, so probably won't make a lot of sense to continue this practice unless it's otherwise required by law or contract. Reasonable suspicion testing seems to be okay. Um, if someone is showing symptoms, I think it's going to be important to document the reason behind the reasonable suspicion testing. Uh, even if you test based on reasonable suspicion, you're, you're not necessarily going to be able to prove that the employee was impaired while at work because uh, marijuana can stay in the system for an extended period of time, which is why documenting the other issues, right, the performance issues, the safety issues that their apparent uh, impairment caused is so important. Random testing also may not be worth much. You're not going to be able to tie it back to those symptoms because it's random, right? They don't necessarily have symptoms. And so um, it's going to be difficult to fit into one of those exceptions under the labor law to be able to use it to take an adverse employment action. Testing for other drugs can presumably continue and remains unknown. 
what do you need in a policy? Um, you're still allowed to enact policies that prohibit use, uh, possession, or distribution of cannabis or any other illegal drug or controlled substance during work hours on the employer's premises and while using the employer's equipment or other property. Be specific in your policy as to when testing will occur if you're going to do testing. And if you can, what drugs will be tested for. So consider removing drugs um, such as cannabis from testing if it's just not something you're gonna look at due to legalization take that off the list, remove drugs that maybe aren't likely to impact performance or safety. Um, and some things may be legal depending on whether they're prescribed or not. So you may wanna think about some exceptions for that. If you're going to take the position that refusal to be tested is going to equate to presumed current impairment, uh, make that very, very, very clear. It's not something you want to surprise an employee with at the last second. Um, it's also important to be clear about consequences. It's the best practice for any policy and this policy is no exception to be clear on consequences and to follow that policy uniformly and fairly between all your employees. Bottom line, a, a well-written policy um, can be super helpful and provide a strong defense if you do take some sort of adverse employment action um, and you can show that you were following your policy. Um, Disciplining based on marijuana. I think this lines up with what we talked about already. So, you know, gloss over it, right? If there's a violation of your policy, it's apparent that they're impaired at work and, and they've had some performance issues. Now, of course, you don't even really need to address the marijuana issue. If there are performance issues, you can just address the performance issues. So you don't need to know if the employee was impaired or not. If their performance is suffering, you can treat that just like any other employee who is suffering from performance issues and discipline them accordingly. Um, and then just a quick note on medical marijuana because these things kind of go hand in hand, although this is very old news. Um, under the public health law, certified medical marijuana users are deemed to have a disability under the New York State Human Rights Law. And as with any disability, employers need to consider reasonable accommodations. However, even in the medical marijuana law, which you know predates the recreational law by several years, um, the public health law does specifically allow employers to still maintain policies that um, prohibit use of cannabis um, while uh, at work. So you can have those policies across the board, whether it's recreational or medical usage. All right, <laughs> I'm all set on marijuana. Um, I know we're short on time. If anyone has questions, uh, uh, let us know um, or feel free to follow up with us later. Yes, thank you so much for having us. Um, we know that that was a lot of information that we covered in an hour, and I know we started a little late, so we ran a little over. We really appreciate your time. And of course, um, feel free to contact either of us. Um, and we also have a, a link on this slide. Um, if you're interested in getting legal alerts, Chloe mentioned a couple of times that um, there's going to be some forthcoming guidance regarding the HERO Act, regarding um, the Marijuana Legalization Act. So um, definitely, uh, if, you're, if you're interested in receiving legal alerts on that, um, that's a good way to do that in real time. That's great. And thank you. Thank you so much for um, doing this today. That is a lot of information. It was, it was now, hard to narrow it down. There were so many things going on. It was hard to narrow it down to 